This is the OTB Television Network, a service of Capital District Off-Track Betting. Coming toward the top of the stretch, Wildcat Red on the rail. Aaron's Orient, General A-Rod on the outside. A wide run for Pablo Del Monte. East Hall is there. Gone as wind cut the corner. They're into the stretch. And it is Wildcat Red, General A-Rod, East Hall, Pablo Del Monte on the far outside. Down to the last 16th, General A-Rod, Wildcat Red. These two continue to go at it. Wildcat Red, General A-Rod, head and head, bobbing heads. Either of the two could have won it. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Down the Stretch. I'm Mark Asano. On this morning's show, we will take a look at my Eclipse Awards ballot. We will welcome in a pair of guests from downstate, beginning with Naira's new Senior Vice President of Racing, Mr. Martin Panza, and he will be followed by Leah Giamatti, who will be sending out the favorite Noble Moon in this afternoon's Jerome. Then later on, time permitting, we'll take a look at both Wednesday's Gulfstream Park Derby, as well as a fascinating entry-level allowance from yesterday at Gulfstream. And being the first Saturday of the new year, my very first down-the-stretch Derby dozen of 2014. So all of that and much, much more if you stay with us on this very cold January 4th morning. Good morning. Happy New Year once again. Driving in this morning um, on the display in my car, it showed one degree. <laughs> now, one is a wonderful handicap in golf, but it is a horrific temperature. So if you do not have to go out this morning, don't settle in, relax, get warm, get comfortable. I think we've got a good show for you this morning. The uh, Eclipse Awards ballots were due yesterday. Now, we do them electronically, have done them that way for a number of years. We do them online. 17 categories for both the equines and the humans. It's become, I think, a little bit more difficult over the years because A, some of the horses, or generally speaking, horses race a bit less, and at least in my opinion, and I think it's the opinion of many others as well, many of the graded stakes races um, have gotten weaker, including the regionalized grade one races. Let's face it, it happens even here at Saratoga, some of the grade ones are kind of weak. We have to select three in each category, and that's done uh, to determine the finalists, which, by the way, will be announced next Wednesday. But only our top choice uh, counts as far as winning the Eclipse Award. So let's take a look, and we're going to begin with champion Steeplechaser, and I voted for Divine Fortune. I personally thought it was a very weak year for the jumpers. Not much consistency whatsoever. I nearly abstained in this category, and I can almost guarantee you that a number of voters will abstain. But in the end, I gave the edge to divine fortune. Now, two-year-old male came down to New Year's Day and shared belief. I selected New Year's Day. He won the most important race for freshmen, the Breeders' Cup Juvenile. And he did it despite missing training time. Following his maiden win at the end of August at Del Mar, he got sick. So to go from a maiden victory to the Breeders' Cup Juvenile, in itself that's quite a, uh, uh, quite a feat, 
But when you miss training time, that adds something special to it. So my vote for champion two-year-old male went to New Year's Day. My vote for the top two-year-old filly went to She's a Tiger, who crossed the finish line first in the Breeders' Cup Juvenile Phillies, only to be disqualified. She got my vote, and I think she'll get, you know, a lot of votes because she was very consistent throughout the year, never finishing worse than second in six starts. If I had told you back in June that Will Take Charge would be an easy selection for me as champion three-year-old male, you would have thought the heat had gotten to me. Eighth in the Derby, seventh in the Preakness, and a wonderful tenth in the Belmont Stakes, Will Take Charge surged to an outstanding second half of the year, winning the Travers and the Clark against older horses and just missing in the Breeders' Cup Classic. So for a colt who had pretty much a dreadful first half of the year, I think Will Take Charge will be a pretty solid winner as champion three-year-old male. Now, the three-year-old filly category, in my opinion, has two deserving winners, Beholder and Princess of Silmar. For decades, we were able to split our votes. Well, a few years ago, they, whoever that might be, decided we couldn't split them anymore, which I think is foolishness. So I couldn't split my vote. Um, in the end, I voted for the likely loser, Princess of Silmar. Now, was this a case of being a homer? You know, because Ed Stanko grew up here in Schenectady. He graduated from the same high school I did. You know, Ed's been on the show numerous times. Well, you know, maybe a little bit, but I don't think so. Her body of work including victories in the Kentucky Oaks, which is a national grade one. And when I refer to it as a national grade one versus a regional grade one, you know, everybody who's anybody ships for the Kentucky Oaks. That's why it's a national grade one. Well, Prince of Silmar also won the Alabama, the Coaching Club American Oaks, and the Beldame. You know, the Kentucky Oaks and the Alabama are the two biggest races for sophomore fillies, aside from the Breeders' Cup. Now listen, Beholder was great, and her powerful victory in the Distaff will likely give her the title. But other than going to the Kentucky Oaks, she never traveled out of California. And it is a huge, and I mean huge, advantage to train and race out of your own stall. Now again, I would have split my vote in here if allowed, but in the end, I voted for Princess of Silmar. The older male category is very poorly named. It used to be called older handicapped male. I think the premise for this category is to award the best main track route horse. And I say that because folks, there's already a turf category. I don't think it is meant that a turf horse be able to win two different categories. That's my opinion. It's based on solid reasoning. So, you know, I am convinced that this category was made to highlight the route horses on, on, on what used to be dirt, now it's the main track, was synthetic. Therefore, I voted for Mucho Macho Man over Game On Dude. Mucho Macho Man ended his 2013 with grade one victories in the awesome again, and of course, the Breeders' Cup Classic. My vote for champion, older female, this was easy, went to Royal Delta. She was very, very good at times in a division which was you know, kind of weak. Remember, three-year-old fillies ran one-two in the distaff. Royal Delta will win this category, and with it, an Eclipse Award for the third year in a row. Now, I thought the sprinters were pretty weak this year, particularly the male sprinters. In this category, 
I gave the slight edge to Breeders' Cup Sprint Hero Secret Circle over the ill-fated points off the bench and Sahara Sky. Although points off the bench won two grade ones to Secret Circles one, points off the bench beat regional company in Southern California, meaning there were really no shippers, while Secret Circle beat the best sprint field assembled by far this year in the Breeders' Cup Sprint. My vote for champion female sprinter went to Groupie Dow. Like Secret Circle, a winner of only two races and a single grade one this year. But that grade one came in the Breeders' Cup Philly and Mare Sprint against all comers. You know, the best female sprint field by far. Now, she may not have been the same Groupie Dow we saw back in 2012, but I think she'll win another Eclipse Award. The turf divisions were easy for me. Wise Dan, who was six for six on grass last year and handled all types of surfaces, firm, good, as well as racing over a bog several times, was a very easy selection. In a division where several horses during the year became grade one winners, while defeating substandard grade one company. My vote for champion female turfer went to Dank. She came to America twice to race. She crushed them in the Beverly D, first time stretching out, if I remember correctly, went back home, returned, and captured the Breeders' Cup filly and mare turf. She should prove to be a pretty convincing winner of the Eclipse. Now we, for the human categories, for both outstanding owner and outstanding breeder, I voted for Ken and Sarah Ramsey. 2013 was just a fabulous year for them and their stallion Kitten's Joy. And I think they have a reasonable chance at sweeping both awards. The apprentice jockey category really can be tricky. You know, I can tell by looking at votes that some voters simply look at the amount of money the apprentices win and vote along those lines. You know, whether or not that's the proper thing to do is questionable. And you know, it's difficult for us to keep track of all the top apprentices around the country. In this category, I voted for Edgar Zayas from South Florida. He finished a very close second behind Victor Carrasco of Maryland in Purse Money 1. But, and this is a huge but, he did something no other apprentice rider did in 2013. Edgar Zayas won a grade one stakes race as an apprentice. Trainer Marty Wolfson used him to ride Starship Truffles in the Princess Rooney. So the only apprentice to win a grade one stakes race, Edgar Zayas, got my vote. Please keep in mind, Jose Ortiz, who is a wonderful rider, was an apprentice for less than three months this year, so I could not vote for Jose. My vote for outstanding trainer went to Todd Pletcher, whose number of graded stakes victories, grade one wins, and 25 million in purses outdistance his rivals. He also won the Belmont Stakes with Palace Malice. Now, the Outstanding Jockey Award for 2013, in my opinion, was the most wide open. Again, in my opinion, any one of five riders, Javier Castellano, Joel Rosario, Johnny Velasquez from here in New York, Gary Stevens, Mike Smith from California, would be a worthy choice. And remember, when they announce the finalists, there's only three finalists. So you're going to have two riders who are very legitimate who are not going to be finalists. In the end, I gave my vote the slight edge to Mike Smith. 
despite riding only one quarter of the races which Javier Castellano did, and only one third of those ridden by Joel Rosario, Mike Smith won 15 grade one races, as compared to only four by both Javier and Joel. 15 to four. Smith won the Belmont Stakes and three Breeders' Cup races. Now again, any of the five I mentioned are worthy, but I voted for Mike Smith, who accomplished more with less. And finally, the horse of the year. And when you vote for horse of the year, it's not only what that particular horse accomplished in his or her division, but what happened in the other divisions. Just remember when favorite trick is a two-year-old, one horse of the year. Well, this was really pretty easy for me. I again voted for Wise Dan. He dominated his turf division, and people underestimate how difficult it is for turf horses to handle all different kinds of surfaces. Listen, almost every turf horse handles it firm, and most handle it good. But you know what? When you start running over a bog, that's, that, that's when only the great ones can handle it. And I will be absolutely shocked if Wise Dan doesn't win another Horse of the Year title. So let's quickly review my Eclipse ballot for 2013 with Wise Dan, my selection for Horse of the Year. Again, I think the Outstanding Jockey Award, which I gave the edge to Mike Smith, is going to be the most wide open. I think Beholder, in the end, will be a pretty easy winner over Princess of Silmar because we're not allowed to split votes. And I think any number of voters, if they were allowed, would have split their votes. Once again, the finalists will be announced next Wednesday. And we are up to our first break on this January 4th edition of the program. Thank you so much for having joined us. When we return, Mr. Martin Panza. As we go to the break, the Mr. Prospector, last Saturday at Gulfstream, the 13 to 10 favorite, number three, Star Harbor. So we're going to take a look at the Mr. Prospector to the break. Back with Martin Panza right after these messages. They're racing in the Mr. Prospector. Off to an even start, Star Harbor speeds out to take the early lead. To the outside, sing another song, and then Fort Loudon, who's third early on the rail, a length and a half off the lead. Traveling Man is next, outside of Upgrade, and Trini Hart along the inside. A priority is seven lengths off the lead early, and Black Diamond Cat is the trailer. As they race past the half-mile pole, it is Star Harbor in front. Sing another song, pressing through a 22 and one quarter. These two in Eka Parta, they've opened up three on Fort Loudon. And then it's Trinity Hart, upgrade to the outside. A priority is ridden along, but gaining ground. Seven lengths off the lead in Black Diamond Cat. They're coming toward the top of the stretch. Star Harbor and Sing Another Song. And they're four lengths ahead of the rest. They went a half mile in 44 and three. They're into the stretch. Star Harbor, Sing Another Song on the outside. Four to Fort Loudon. And then it's Trinity Hart along the rail and traveling man to the outside. And now, Sing Another Song has taken the lead. Sing Another Song moving away from Star Harbor. Fort Loudon closing late. Sing Another Song and Juan Leva in the Mr. Prospector. And then it was Fort Loudon, Star Harbor, and Black Diamond Cat. This is the OTB Television Network, a service of Capital District Off-Track Betting. Here in upstate New York, no one provides bettors with more wagering options than Capital OTB. Our network of branch and easy bet locations stretches from the mid-Hudson Valley all the way to the Canadian border and west to central New York. So whether you need to place a bet, fund your Capital Bets account, or watch the next big race, all the action is just around the corner. A full list of our branch and easy bet locations can be found online at CapitalOTB.com. Capital OTB, the better and most convenient choice for wagering in upstate New York. Welcome back to Down the Stretch, everyone. I'm Mark Cassano, and the Mr. Prospector went to sing another song for Ron Pellegrini, who was on the show about a month ago, Juan Leva, by a length and three quarters over Fort Loudon and Star Harbor. Our first guest of the new year is the new senior vice president of racing. 
from the New York Racing Association. We welcome in Mr. Martin Panza. Martin, Mark Cassano welcoming you to Down the Stretch. Good morning, Mark. Thank you. Nice, Appreciate being on. Nice to have you, Martin. First off, um, Aqueduct will be running today? Yep, we are racing today, and uh, I think the track's in pretty good shape, so looking forward to it. All right. Martin, tell our audience a little bit about yourself, if you would. Well, I've been out in California working at Hollywood Park for about the last 20 years as director of racing, racing secretary. Um, I worked for the Breeders' Cup, for the Dubai Racing Club over in Dubai. Um, been on various different boards, NTRA, um, Breeders' Cup, uh, different panels. So pretty well-rounded in the racing business, I think. Um, done most of the jobs in the racing department, clerk of scales, patrol judge, uh, paddock judge. So I think I have a pretty good handle on, on racing in general. Martin, your thoughts on the closing of Hollywood Park, and in your opinion, was there any way it could have been avoided? Well, obviously, it's you know it's very sad, and it's going to hurt the entire industry when you lose a major racetrack like that. I mean, for I think in the '60s and '70s, for about 20 years in a row, Hollywood Park led the nation in attendance, handle purses. Um, you know, was pretty much the lead track in the country. Um, you know, as real estate gets more and more valuable in the inner cities, uh, and as racetracks become less profitable because we've basically lost our monopoly on gambling, I suppose you'll start to see more closures of racetracks. It's just something that's going to be unavoidable. Martin, what will be some of the differences for you from working in California to now working here in New York? Well, the, the first one that you know we're dealing with right now is obviously the weather. Um, we don't get this drastic of weather out in California, <laughs> so it'll be learning, um, you know, just when we have to call races off and, and the different track conditions and, and then you know, carting those races back, and not only in the wintertime, but even in the summer, just with, you know, you get a lot more rain back here and turf racing and, and how to reschedule stuff. So um, that will be a learning process through the year of just sort of getting used to it and then, you know, okay, here's here's the process or, or here's how we're going to handle these different situations. Um, at the end of the day, racing is racing. We're getting horses from point A to point B and try and keep it as simple as possible and, and you know, try to get the fullest fields we can at, at each meet and, and then, you know, bring integrity and safety to it where, you know, you're allowing people to bet on these races and they feel that, you know, they're getting a fair shake. Martin, what are some of the changes you're thinking about making here in New York how can you improve racing here at Naira? Well, I, I'm not going to get into specific changes yet because I still have to sit down with the horsemen's group and with management here. But, you know, there will be some changes in house rules and, and there will just be some changes in the philosophy of how races are written. Uh, and then we'll look to build more big days in New York. Um, people, fans respond to big days, and we've got to get more people to the track and we've got to create events that people want to come out and see. And not only just, you know, for the, the racing fan that's here every day, but for the fans that maybe only come once or twice a year, we need to create events that they'll want to come and see. And so that's what we'll move towards over the next, you know, three, four, five, six months, uh, changing some of the house rules, uh, creating some bigger events, and changing sort of, uh, what the day-to-day -day racing looks like. Can you give us uh, some kind of an idea about, you know, your thoughts on some of those big days, specifically at Belmont and Saratoga? No, I'm, I'm not at the stage yet where I can go into details on that. Uh, hopefully in the next month we'll begin to get to that point, but I've still got to go through it with board members and, and with the horsemen's group, with Rick Violet, and I'm just not at that stage yet to to make public announcements on what we're going to do. When, in, uh, when at Hollywood Park you instituted the Autumn Turf Festival, you instituted the uh, American Oaks, which, 
you know, featured international competition in the early years. I mean, anything similar to that, a possibility here in New York? Well, I think so. I mean, obviously, you know, being on the East Coast, you're so close to Europe, and so we've got to look at ways to, how do we get more European participation? Um, and then, you know, what what windows are open in American racing that you can create a stakes event and get the best horses in America to come to New York? And so we've got to look at that, and we've got to look at the timing for Europe, uh, the timing in Japan, and see if we can't bring you know, foreign horses here to help us create events, and then are there some windows in American racing that haven't been exploited yet that we can use in New York? And so, you know, you've got two turf courses at Belmont, two turf courses at Saratoga. Those are advantages. Um, the proximity to Europe is an advantage, and so those are all things that we're currently looking at, trying to figure out how do we take advantage of this uh, to the best of our ability. Martin, you've been on the American Graded Stakes Committee. I've got to ask you, are, are there simply too many stakes races for the number of horses we have in training now? Well, let me clarify. I have been on it in the past. I have not been on it for about the last 10 years. Um, there probably are. I mean, it, it just, you know, we've got so many graded stakes, and if you start looking at field size in those races and when they're five and six horse fields it probably tells you that there's too many opportunities out there um, but that's not for me to say that's for that committee to decide and and you know they're looking at what other countries have and trying to follow the same sort of ratios that exist in the other countries um, I, I think you know as we've seen crop size reduce um, due to the economic conditions in the United States, um, probably the number of graded stakes has dropped down a little bit over the last couple of years, um, and it probably wouldn't be a bad thing if it continued to. Um, but there's a fine line there because, you know, breeders rely on those graded stakes to sort of um, promote their foals or their mares, and so there's a fine line between too many of them and not enough of them. Um, so... It's something that I'm sure the Great Estates Committee is looking at every year. In fact, I know they are. Um, and they've they've made some steps just in the last month to try and restrict races that are getting black type because they felt that black type was getting too easy to get and it was cheapening the, the sales books. So, you know, it's something that I think they're constantly looking at. The New York bread program critical here in the Empire State and critical for Naira with year-round racing. Would you expect any significant changes to the state bread program, how Naira uses those races? Well, I think we need to grow the program, and I think there's a board meeting January 28th that I'm looking forward to attending up in Saratoga. Um, you know, we need to find ways to, to make the New York bread program stronger, and, and certainly... More foals on the ground, you know, does it provides Naira with more product. It also provides the state of New York with more jobs, and that's what we want. We want a healthy racing program. We want more jobs in New York, more foals on the ground. We want there to be a vibrant breeding program. We want the breeders to be able to sell their foals if they choose to for profit. Uh, if they choose to race them, we want a strong program that they can race them in. And I'm a big believer in breed programs. I think we did a lot of stuff in California to help strengthen that breed program. And I'll certainly be looking forward to working with the breeders in this state to see what we can do uh, to strengthen it in New York. And, and, you know, certainly during aqueduct in the wintertime, we rely very heavily on the New York breads. We rely on them throughout the year, but more so probably in the winter months. And so it's to our advantage to have more foals on the ground. And more foals on the ground obviously means the farms are doing better. They have more clients. Maybe there's more farms. There's more stallions. That means more jobs for the state of New York, and that's a good thing. We had Linda Rice on a couple of weeks ago, and she spoke very briefly about some of the changes in the new condition book. Martin, specifically for our audience members, what are some of the changes they're going to see with you writing the races? Well, first of all, in about another week or two, I won't be writing the 
the book anymore. There'll be a racing secretary in place. Um, but for what we did for this book, uh, we just tried to clean up the, the claiming races in that if it's a non-two claimer, it is just a straight non-two claimer. Uh, it, it doesn't allow, say, a three-year-old that's got five or six wins into that race or a horse that, say, hasn't won a race in six months into that race. It's just for horses that have not won two races lifetime. And the same thing for the non-threes. Um, in the past, a three-year-old could just stay in that race forever, and if he kept winning it, he could just keep running in it. Mm-hmm. And to me, that's not fair. As you win a race, the point is that you should be moving along to the next condition. And so if you win a non-two, you're now going to have to move up to the non-three. And if you win the non-three, then you're going to have to go to the open claiming race. And so you get horses moving forward and not just sitting there beating up on the same horses over and over again. Um, there'll be some other changes down the road, but I have to move slowly. I, I don't want to, you know, ask the New York horsemen to, to change too much all at once. And anything we do will be trying to bring an integrity to the program and trying to get horses to move forward. Um, obviously, there's one winner every race, and there's a lot of losers. Um, your job as a race secretary is to try to keep horses elevated uh, because as you get beat, the tendency is to want to drop down. And our job is to try to keep horses elevated and to keep their value uh, for their owners. And so that's what we'll be trying to do as we create a new program in New York. Martin, can you tell us who the new racing secretary will be? Um, for the aqueduct meet, it'll be a gentleman named Daniel Edson. Uh, he was my assistant out at Hollywood Park for several years. He's been racing secretary at Delaware Park, racing secretary at Golden Gate. And he'll do the winter meet at Aqueduct. Uh, we're in the process of hiring another racing secretary that will be in charge of Belmont, Saratoga, and the Belmont fall meet. So we we'll actually have two racing secretaries that will do year-round racing in New York rather than in the past having one. Um, my hat's off to P.J. Campo and to Mike Lakeau, um for doing it 52 weeks a year. Um, it's it's just, in my mind, too much to ask of one person. And so we're going to divide it up moving forward. One gentleman doing it for six months at Aqueduct, one gentleman doing it for six months at Belmont and Saratoga. It keeps people fresh, and I think it just is good to have two different opinions on these race meets. It's just going to make New York racing even stronger. I think that's a wonderful idea. Martin, how much... Are you looking forward to Saratoga? Uh, Saratoga is obviously a very special place, and I've had, you know, I've been there as a guest and obviously as a racing secretary from Hollywood Park visiting to recruit horsemen for California. Um, I'm looking forward to it. Obviously, there's tremendous history there, and I'm honored to sort of be in charge of, of reshaping the stake schedules up there and the racing program up there. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing how it compares to Del Mar, and, and certainly they're, they're two different facilities on two different coasts. But um, certainly it, it's the highlight of East Coast racing, and you know, it, it, you know, who wouldn't be looking forward to it? Before we let you go, may I make a suggestion concerning Saratoga? Sure. Charlie Lepresti and Wise Dan won the four-star Dave handicap each of the last two years at the spot. Charlie told us that it served as a perfect prep timing-wise for the Woodbine Million, but Charlie told us uh, at the end of last year that he was probably going to pass on handicap racing for Wise Dan because he would just be burdened with too much weight. Now, we've already got the Bernard Baruch, as a turf handicap at Saratoga, would you consider making the four-star Dave more of a wait-for-age type of race so we have a better chance of seeing the likely two-time horse of the year this summer at the spa? I'm not sure that in the summertime that you can really get away with running wait-for-age races. As much as we would love to have Wise Dan and the four-star Dave, I also don't want a four-horse field and the four-star Dave. 
And to make horses carry the same weight as Wise Dan in August, um, I, I'm not sure that's something I want to do. Now, might we put allowance conditions on that race so that he can figure out what his weight is right. and, and what he's going to have to give to everyone else? That might be a consideration. But weight for age races only work at certain times of the year and under certain conditions. Um, we tried that in California with the Hollywood Gold Cup, which was for years a handicap, and we made it a weight for age race and where everyone was carrying the same weight. And we found everyone just started leaving for the Stephen Foster because they said, well, I can't beat the top horse. I don't want to carry the same weight. So I'll go to Stephen Foster where I'm getting, it's a handicap, and I'm getting eight pounds from the top horse. So you have to be very careful um, how you place weight for age races during the year. Um, it's something we'll look at, but my gut instinct is that in August, uh, I probably would not do that. Now, if the purse was $2 million, um, <laughs> then maybe you could do it because people are going to run for that much money. But at 500000 and you look at the third-place horse and he's only getting 50000 or the fourth-place horse that might only be getting 5%, $25,000, you know, our job is to get the biggest fields we can. Uh, the best racing we can, and, and that's what we'll try to do as we look at the stakes races and what those conditions will be. Well, Martin, first of all, congratulations on the new position. Best of luck with the New York Racing Association, and thank you so much for having joined us this morning on Down the Stretch. Thank you. My pleasure. I'd like to be on any time. I appreciate it. Thank you, Martin. We'll be calling you back. Martin Panza, ladies and gentlemen, the Senior Vice President of Racing for the New York Racing Association. And we are up to our next break when we return back to New York, where we'll welcome in Leah Giamatti as we go to the break. The affectionately New Year's Day in New York, six to five favorite in the four horse field, number one, centering. So we'll take a look at the affectionately to the break. Back with Leah Giamatti right after these messages. And they're off. Hesitant start for Royal Lahaina. And she trails the field. Teen Pauline has got the early lead. Street Secret runs in second. Then it's centering in third. And Royal Lahaina, the trailer. Moving for the turn. It's Teen Pauline on top here by two and a half lengths. Street Secret runs in second. It's another two lengths back to centering. And two more to Royal Lahaina. The opening quarter mile was running 24 and two fifth seconds, and they're heading up the back stretch. Teen Pauline in front, length and a half. Street Secret in second, uh, then it's centering, and Royal Lahaina, so positions unchanged as they race midway up the back stretch. Teen Pauline in front by a length. Street Secret continues to chase in second. The half mile in this affectionately stakes 49 and one fifth seconds. Teen Pauline and Erod Ortiz Jr. continue to lead here. The lead's almost two lengths. Street Secret in second. Now Roy Lahaina comes through on the inside to take third. Centering is fourth, but centering is now moving up. They're midway around the far turn. Teen Pauline, a little more than a length. Street Secret is second. By a neck on the outside is centering. Then Royal Lahaina is now gaining ground down towards the rail. But Teen Pauline is still the one to catch. She ran three quarters in 114. Teen Pauline in front by two. Centering up on the outside into second. Royal Lahaina down at the rail. And Street Secret is now in fourth as they pass the eighth pole. Teen Pauline with something left here. Teen Pauline opens up in deep stretch. And it's Teen Pauline a front running winner of the affectionately stakes five lengths back to centering then royal lahaina and street sacred this is the otb television network a service of capital district off track betting Using CapitalOTBBet.com is as easy as one, two, three. One, simply log on with your username and password from the homepage. Two, fund your Capital OTB account through our Easy Money, Green Dot, or Visa MasterCard options. And three, place your bet on one of our three easy to navigate wagering platforms, Capital Bet TV. 
Capital Bet Express or Capital Bet Pro. CapitalOTBBet.com. Log on today. Welcome back to Down the Stretch, everyone. I'm Mark Asano. My thanks to Martin Panza once again for having joined us. And Teen Pauline, Todd Pletchery, Rod Ortiz Jr. by four and three quarters over centering to win the affectionately. Our final guest this morning has a pair of very nice three-year-olds in her barn in Sweet Reason and Noble Moon, the latter who will start later today in the Jerome here in New York. We welcome in live via telephone, Leah Giamatti. Leah Marcasano, welcoming you back to Down the Stretch. Thank you very much. It's always nice to have you. Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you, too. Let us begin with Noble Moon. And as our audience watches his debut back on September 14th at Belmont, for our audience, he is number one breaking from the inside post. Leah, tell us, how did he train up to this, his first start? He has been impressive all the way through um, from his very first breeze. So I was, I had high hopes for him right from the start. He's a very forward horse and very, and he's all business and, you know, every work was better and better. So. I mean, he was 25 to 1 in here, so he obviously surprised the betters. Did it surprise you at all the way he ran? Well, I knew he would run well. Um, I, I wasn't sure how well. I The only knock, the only doubt I had in my mind was he didn't seem to be as interested in his breezes when he got behind horses and got some dirt in his face. He'd get busy playing. He'd be looking at other things, and he just wasn't focused. So I wasn't sure with that one hole what would happen if he didn't break well. Um, as it turned out, I didn't find out in the first race because he went wire to wire, and he showed a lot of gut. Um, you know, I didn't know turning for home if he would be able to, if he would have enough fight left in him to when they came to him, but he did. You know, he really, he was very impressive all the way to the end of that race. He really, he really fought back when they came to him. So, so that was, um, I, I was expecting a good race. Maybe not that good, but I thought he'd done well. In a moment, we're going to have a shot of him on the screen for our audience. Take a moment to describe him from a physical standpoint and then tell us what's he like mentally. He's pretty impressive looking. He definitely would turn your head if you saw him come by. He's a very strong, muscular horse. Not very tall, but he's just perfectly proportioned, um, muscular. He's, he's, um, he's also very sure of himself. He's all business. He comes by with his head bowed, and he's pulling on the rider all the time on the track. So you really get the impression that he's a nice horse and that he knows he's a nice horse. <laughs> well, following that successful debut, you sent Noble Moon to the Nashua. For our audience, he will be number six in here. Watch very closely after the start as he gets steadied back. Leah, you mentioned in his training leading up to the debut, he didn't train nearly as well behind horses in getting dirt kicked in his face. It didn't happen in his debut, but it happened here in the Nashua. Talk about this, if you would. Yes, I, I was. You know, it, it, I was very, th I was thrilled with that race because for that reason. I, I wasn't sure what he would do if he ended up being shuffled back behind horses or kind of losing touch with the, with the field. That first race, that second race in the Nashua, he got hit really hard. I mean, almost to the point where he lost his balance, leaving the gate. So um, that was one thing he had to overcome. And then the fact that he made up all that ground and and finished so well, it made me feel better about what I was worried about. Now, after I said that he did, he would train wouldn't train as well when he'd get behind another horse that he was working with, but we would work on that. You know, I schooled him several times because I was afraid of it. So anyway, in that in the Nashua, he showed me I don't have anything to worry about in that respect. <laughs> what did Alex Solis wrote him in his first two starts? What did Alex have to say to you after the Nashua? Well, just that, that he, was, he said if it weren't for the fact that he was such a big, strong horse, he might have gotten knocked down. He got hit so hard. So he was very impressed with him also in that race um that he just that he didn't lose interest he despite being hit so hard he he wanted to go and he 
you know, he, he ended up going very, very wide, too. So he really did. He, he, he worked hard in that race. And, and Alex was impressed with him when he came back. Speaking of Alex, he is not riding Noble Moon today. He's riding a shipper instead. Can you tell us why? Well, I made the call with Jeff, the owner. We were thinking mostly about, number one, the weather up here, and Alex is based now down in Florida, and number two, the inner track. And we thought we might be better off just kind of sticking with somebody that's been riding up here all winter and riding on the inner track. And Irad was open and interested, and so we thought we'd make that call. I didn't know that Alex would be coming up anyway to to ride, and I hope he does well and proves me wrong. Um, that it wasn't nothing against Alex. I love Alex. He's a he's a very good rider, excellent rider. He's done really well with us, and will continue to do well with us. Um, just I thought I, we made that call for this particular race. We knew the temperatures were going to be cold, and the inner between that and the inner track, we just thought maybe we should stick with somebody that's that's here riding. Now I'm. Trusting my memory, which is dangerous at my age, but I seem to recall that following the Nashua, the original plan was to go to the Remsen with him. Yes. If it is, what happened? He was he was entered, and it was the night before um, the race. He broke out in hives, and then his face kind of swelled up, and his eyes swelled up. He, he had a reaction to something. I don't know what. And where normally you could let it go and they go away on their own, and you, you're usually fine running after a horse has a little bout with hives. He got so uncomfortable that we had to treat him around 11 or 12 that night. So we had to scratch. Now, has he missed any significant training time coming into the Jerome, either because of that situation or the, the recent weather in, in New York? No, not at all. The, the hives, he didn't lose anything over. We went right on. And um, the weather, we've been lucky that the weather reports have been fairly accurate, so we could plan ahead for it. And we've had very, we've had nice weather in between the, the bouts of bad weather, and they've done a very good job of keeping the track here good, you know, in between. And so we haven't missed any training, really. You know, as long as you have a heads up about when the weather's coming and you can train accordingly, you can you can do just fine. Now, you've been working him kind of long and slow. I, I like those lengthy workouts, you know, maybe a little Alan Jerkins type of works, but do you or should we expect him to show more speed from the inside post later this afternoon? Well, uh, more speed than than what you than the national. In the morning, perhaps. Yeah, I mean, you know, you, in looking at those works, obviously a mile and forty-five and one breezing right. doesn't jump out and say, "Man, he's going to leave the gate running." Right. But he left the gate running in his debut, and you drew the rail. So, can we expect him to be forwardly placed? Uh, yes, I think so. I think he, he has. He he obviously has a natural turn up. He, he's. He's quick on his own. Without we don't have to put that into him. My my emphasis was just kind of getting him to relax and go know that he's got to go around two turns. Don't get anxious. Don't go into the first turn and you know try to get and get headstrong down the backside and then you know leave it all over there instead of where it belongs in the in the stretch. So um, I don't think we have to worry about that. Whether he'll be on the lead or not, we'll see. We'll see how the. I think he he can be on the lead. And that would be fine. Um, we can sit off the pace, too. But he'll be, he should be right there, I don't think. Unless somebody bangs us again like they did the no. last time, I think we'll be all right. <laughs> now, before we let you go, let's briefly discuss your newly turned three-year-old Philly Sweet Reason. How is she doing? And do you have any plans for her at this point? She's doing very well. We turned her out for about a month, and she started back. She's galloping now. She did a little two-minute lick couple days ago before the snow and her next breeze will she'll we'll probably breeze her within the next few days um i tentatively am looking at the busher i don't know if we'll be ready for that because it's long and it that only gives me another you know it doesn't it gives me a month i think so if we're ready we'll we'll start there if not we'll 
we'll look around and see what else what our other options are. But she's doing great. She looks fantastic. Well, Leah, first of all, Happy New Year. Thank you so much for having joined us this morning on Down the Stretch, and we wish you all the best in bringing Sweet Reason back to the races, and we wish you all the best with Noble Moon later this afternoon. This Jerome. Thank you very much. Thank you, Leah. Leah Germati, ladies and gentlemen. All right. Two races, although we're only going to take a look at one. You saw the stretch run of the Gulfstream Park Derby in the open. Um, where General A. Rod set an absolutely perfect outside trip and, uh, and out game Wildcat Red to win it. But we are going to take a look at yesterday's ninth race at Gulfstream. It was an entry level allowance event for newly turned three year olds going a mile and an eighth. And that's, you know, quite something for that early in the year. A field of seven with number one cousin Stephen from Chad Brown, the 17 to 10 betting favorite. So for the call of Friday's ninth race from Gulfstream, here's Larry Colmus. They're all in line. They're off. Good start. Ichiban Warriors straight out to take the early lead. Commissioner came out well. Cousin Steven and Top Billinger close up two. And then it's ease on by to the outside. Solemnly Swear rides the rail into the turn. Five lengths off the lead. High Kodiak Warrior is the trailer. So the two plancher horses are going to kick on here. Ichiban Warrior and Commissioner are 1-2, and Ichiban Warrior has opened up a two-length lead on Commissioner as Cousin Steven moves up to his outside. After that, it's ease on by and solemnly swear. Then it's back to top billing, who was closer and has now dropped back to last, having been passed on the outside by High Kodiak Warrior. 24 and one was the first quarter. Onto the back stretch they go. Ichiban Warrior, the leader, and Cousin Steven is moving now to the outside. He's a length and a half behind. And then it's Commissioner in third, just in behind the leaders, followed by ease on by, solemnly swear to the inside, and High Kodiak Warrior, Top billing is last at this stage, and he is eight lengths off the lead. The pace is not fast at all. They went 49 flat for the first half mile, and it's Ichiban Warrior on top into the far turn. And Cousin Steven continues to run along second, Commissioner third to the inside. After that, Solemnly Swear, who's under a drive. And then to the outside, it's ease on by High Kodiak Warrior. Where's Top Billing going to go? Top Billing is down on the inside, six lengths off the lead. Looks like he's full of run as they come toward the top of the stretch. It is still Ichiban Warrior. Ichiban Warrior, the leader at the top of the lane by two. And then Cousin Steven to the outside. Top Billing is now splitting horses in a very tight spot there. He tried to squeeze through, and he's got through now. And here he comes with High Kodiak Warrior and Commissioner. Here comes Top Billing and Commissioner. These two emerge out of the pack. Commissioner and Top Billing. Commissioner did it. Top Billing was second, and then came Ichiban Warrior or High Kodiak Warrior. Commissioner, in his first start since breaking his maiden, on August 28th at Saratoga, holds on to neck top billing to capture Friday's ninth at Gulfstream. Pretty interesting for both these Colts. Commissioner is the son of AP Indy, out of route specialist Flaming Heart, He's trained by Todd Pletcher. Top billing, who broke his maiden in his debut at Laurel for Shug. That's kind of unusual. Is a son of Curlin, out of an AP Indy mare, Parade Queen. Couple of interesting three-year-olds run one, two in that entry-level allowance. Favorite cousin Steven finished a disappointing fifth. Minute 50.72, last three furlongs in a very respectable 36.91. All right, first Saturday of the new year. We are 17 weeks away from the first Saturday in May, and we are about to unveil our first list of down-the-stretch Derby Dozen for the three-year-olds of 2014. Folks, keep in mind, last year at this time, the eventual Derby winner, Orb, had only broken his maiden. So here's a quick look at our first down-the-stretch Derby Dozen of the year. Beginning with number one, Honor Code, the Remsen winner, an impressive spot maiden winner, 
Can Shug win his second derby in a row? And can a son of AP Indy finally win a Kentucky Derby? At number two is Goldhawk. Two for two for Steve Asmussen. He is a son of empire maker out of champion caressing. I like he raced in traffic both of his starts. Number three is Shared Belief. Impressive winner of the Hollywood Preview in the Futurity. He's three for three for Jerry Hollendorfer. Pedigree leans a bit towards speed. The Robert Lewis on February 8th is next. Number four is Midnight Hawk by Midnight Loot. Was an impressive debut winner for Bob Baffert. He broke slowly. He moved steadily to the lead. He came back to the rider, sat third, then moved away down the lane. At number five is Cool Samurai from John Sheriffs, who won the Derby with Giacomo. Comes this late runner who is talented, albeit still a bit green. At number six is Cairo Prince. After easily capturing the Nashua, he lost a heartbreaker to honor code in that paceless Remsen Karen McLaughlin trains. At number seven is Wicked Strong. Jimmy Jerkins' trainee finished a solid third in the bizarrely run Remsen. At number eight is Candy Boy. While shared belief absolutely dominated the Hollywood futurity, this Colt was an interesting second after making a backstretch long move which took him from 10th to the lead. He is trained by John Sadler. At number nine is Strong Mandate, the hopeful hero was a solid third in the Breeders' Cup Juvenile from a brutal post position. Will Wayne Lucas have more magic in 2014? At number 10 is Havana. The Champagne winner was second in the Breeders' Cup Juvenile. Talented two-year-old will have to prove, you know, as will all the others, that he can stretch out for Todd Pletcher. At number 11 is Coup de Gras. Chad Brown trains this allowance winner who is two for two. Although he hasn't won by open lengths, he has shown determination. And at number 12 is Tapature for Steve Asmussen. Really was kind of disappointing until he put it all together in his last race in the Kentucky Jockey Club. So there you have it. Our first down the stretch derby dozen of the year, headed by honor code, but featuring little more lightly raced colts like Gold Hawk, like Midnight Hawk, like Cool Samurai. Going to be an interesting 17 weeks leading up to the first Saturday in May. All right, time to thank all the folks who helped get this week's show on the air, our first of the year here at the Clubhouse Racebook Studios in Albany. Our associate producer, Julie Hoxie, as well as Brian Dorenzo. Back in the control room in Schenectady, Pat Peretta directed, took care of all pre-production. And on audio, we welcome back our old friend Peter Persico. Thanks to this morning's guests, Leah Giamatti and Martin Panza. And as always, thank you very much for having tuned in. By the way, if you missed any of this morning's show, starting on Monday, you're not going to be able to get it, unfortunately, over the weekend, but beginning on Mondays, Down the Stretch will be up on Capital's YouTube channel. You can go to CapitalODB.com, click on the YouTube beginning on Monday, and in case you missed any of this morning's show, you can catch what you missed. So again, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so very much for having joined us this morning on Down the Stretch. Stay warm, have a wonderful weekend and a terrific upcoming week. And from all of us here at Down the Stretch, we'll see you next week. You're watching OTB TV, a service of Capital Off Track Betting.